In this video, I'm going to talk about the idea of sampling and surveys as a way to collect information to make decisions. Um, the first thing that we need to talk about is the idea of population versus sample. A population represents all members. of a set. So if you're going to do a population uh, of people who live in the United States, you have to deal with every single American has to be involved in whatever you're doing to get the total population of United people in the United States. Now, uh, that's usually impossible to get everybody to do in your set, unless your uh, set is extremely small, you can't get the population. So instead, um, you want to go with a sample instead. A sample is part of that population. So if I was dealing with the idea of here's my population, a sample would just be part of it. That's how they get uh, polling data and stuff when they uh, ask about political opinions, like 75% of Democrats say this. Well, obviously, they don't go and ask everybody who's a Democrat to uh, say what they believe, or Republicans either. What they do is take a random number, or, or they pick a number of people and uh, try to assess them Maybe random. I say random because I assume they're doing things in the best interest of the uh, study, but in many cases they're probably not. So they pick a group of them, maybe 50 or 25 or 100 or whatever, and then they garner information about uh, the overall belief system based on that sample. That's, how, that's what they're doing. So the real goal is to try to pick a sample that's representative of your population. If you don't, it becomes a problem. That's called this process is called sampling. And there's a few different ways that you can do it. Uh, some of them are listed here. The first is a convenient sample. A convenient sample is one is easily accessible. So if I wanted to uh, poll somebody uh, who were like. I wanted to poll Democrats about something. I might poll only local Democrats because I know where the local Democratic office is. So it's easy for me, or the headquarters or whatever, it's easy for me to go down there and just ask people. Now that might not give a um, uh, realistic view of how Democrats think because I live in one area and Democrats here may be different than Democrats in other parts of the country, but it's an easily accessible sample, so I guess that's good enough, but not really. Um, the next step would be looking at uh, self-selected samples. Self-selected is a nice way of saying volunteer. I ask people who are interested to give information. That is not exactly the best way to get uh, unbiased information in your set, just because you're getting people who are passionate about it. If you only ask people who vol uh, to volunteer to do it, you're basically getting people who care a lot about it in one way or the other. So they're, you know, they have a true opinion. They're not uh, people who won't be affected by it or whatever. A systematic sample is a little bit more um, realistic. It has less bias in it. In this case, you want to order the population and then you want to uh, pick people at random intervals. Like if uh, there's an elementary school and they need to assess something about field day or whatever. It would be ridiculous for them to go and uh, the teacher who's assigned the activity to, ass uh, to do the survey just picks people from their class because it's convenient. You're only getting maybe he or she's a fifth grade teacher. You only get fifth grade kid information. That doesn't help you. Um, a self-selected sample is, hey, who wants to fill out this survey about field day? Well, some people who may be really interested in field day just don't feel like it or don't like the survey or whatever, so they just don't do it. Or you have to go online and they're trying to do other stuff, whatever it happens to be. A systematic sample <clears throat> would probably split the school, which it already is, into classes, so you make sure that some people from every grade, and then you have an interval system to choose. Like maybe you go down the roster and you choose use um, every third person until you get six respondents, which means you could potentially get somebody, you get the third person, you get the sixth person, the ninth person, but then uh, if the class only has 
15 in it or whatever, then it'll cycle back around so there's a chance you'll get the people who you missed before. So um, that's a systematic sample. You've organized it, uh, you've organized the population, and then you use an interval to pick people, uh, or maybe randomly, like you have them pick uh, six people or whatever it happens to be. Uh, the other type is a uh, random sample. And this is where all members of a population are equally as likely uh, to be chosen. Now, a countrywide uh, sort of random sample is very unlikely. You're going to pick from certain things. I mean, you can't get everybody. But if we're in our school scenario, for instance, if you just put all the kids' names in, uh, no matter what grade they're in, all in, and you pick 50 of them out, and you shake it up each time and whatever, it's a random sample. So uh, it's possible to do it if the population is small enough and make it legitimate. So those are the sampling types. So convenience, it's just easy for the person who's doing it. So the person who's sampling, it's simple for them. Uh, Self-selected sample means that they volunteered. Uh, systematic sample means you order the population in some way, and then you use random intervals to pick them. And then a random sample, with everybody has the same amount of likelihood uh, to be picked uh, for the survey as anybody, or for your sample group as anybody else. From there, uh, we're going to look at sampling bias for just a second uh, to determine whether these situations introduce bias in the sampling process. Bias would be that uh, certain groups of people will be chosen over others. In the first one, it says, uh, a newspaper article about property taxes asked readers to call the newspaper to express their, uh, their opinions. So in this case, what you're really dealing with, of course, is a um, self-selected sample. not sample, sample. And this is a bias method because you basically get the passionate people due to the passionate nature of the respondents. Only people who care about it deeply are going to call in. It's like uh, radio shows with call-ins. They pay, usually have to have uh, reasonably large groups of people listening to them because like for every 15 or 20 people or something, you may get one caller. So uh, it's one of those things about it. This is a self-selected sample. Self-selected samples are generally biased. Uh, the next one says a reporter interviews sorry, uh, people attending a local sporting event. Well, this is a convenience sample and this is bias because uh, there's a little bit more uh, uh, homogenous feel to how it goes. You're basically going to get sports fans. One of the things in uh, the local system that I'm working in is they want to put turf out on the field. Well, if you go to a football game and ask the people who go to the game, a lot of them will say that they really support the idea of having turf. But if you go you know, to a, the library or something, they may say, well, couldn't that money be spent on books or whatever it happens to be? So in that case, you're uh, adding bias into the situation by picking like-minded individuals, people who'd spend Friday night at a sporting event or whatever. And the last one says, a political polling company calls every 30th person in the phone book. So basically, they take the entire phone book and um, they call the 30th person each time. This is a systematic sample. because there's a system in place. Anytime it says every 30th person or whatever, it generally means that it's uh, um, the, uh, the it's systematic. I'm sorry. Now, is there bias in it? Possibly. Depends on what they're asking. If they're asking about phone service, then it may be different because some people aren't listed in the phone book anyway. Uh, that's 
back uh, years ago it might have been different and uh, even then you're basically getting a certain subset of people who are in the phone book so if you pull the 30th is it as biased as going to sports fans and asking them about turf no obviously not but there is a possible bias there uh, the newspaper article asking for a self-selected uh, trying to create a self-selected sample it's much more biased but there is possible bias in the idea that you would pick people out of a phone book because some people are unlisted and you know some people only have cell phones and they don't list themselves in a phone book that kind of thing so depending on the phone book depending on the question there is a possible bias in place so that's the kind of stuff that you have to uh, consider when you sample a group and uh, the last section is that I want to talk about about is the idea of completing a study. What types of studies are there? And the three I'm going to talk about are observational studies, um, controlled experiments, and surveys. Now, observational studies are studies where uh, the study is done in a way that does not affect the sample group. So an observational study is just kind of where you watch what was going to happen anyway. You're not affecting it, you're not changing anything, uh, you're just sort of observing what's going on in the, the regular scenario that's there. Uh, the next type would be a controlled exper uh, experiment. In this group you have two groups. You have the control group and the control group is the group that uh, you just keep normal, it doesn't change or anything. Uh, on the other side of it you have the experimental group. The experimental group is the one that you uh, actually impose treatment, so you actually do something to them, whatever it happens to be. Uh, and the control group just stays the same. So they're the status quo group. The nice thing about the uh, control experiment is that you have some idea that uh, what you're doing has an effect outside of anything else. Like you can uh, see that that specific change affected uh, the people in the control uh, in the experimental group versus the control group. But you know it's not always the best way to do it and there are certain things you can't do. Uh, there are certain rules about whether you're legally allowed to affect one group and not affect another and it just sort of depends on the scenario. And the last one would be a survey. The survey is when you ask all members of a sample set Uh, some questions. So in the first case you're just observing what they're doing. In the second you're splitting them into two groups, applying a treatment to experimental group and seeing if they're affected, diff if their uh, lives change in some way compared to the control group which is the status quo and doesn't change. It's like you were never even involved. And the last one is a survey where you basically just ask all the members of your sample set uh, some questions. Uh, now you can add bias in the survey questions but I'll have a different video on that in the future. So that's it, completing a study, uh, sampling a set, and looking for bias in that sample set.